Welcome to Winning Conversations. Today, Andy and I sat down to enjoy a conversation with one of our very favorites here at Heritage, and that's Deborah Young. You know, Deborah lives a life of boldness for Christ. Uh, She really impacts everybody she meets. Her lifestyle of evangelism and outreach just goes beyond the four walls of our church. And uh, like she says it the best, she just, her life is ministry. And everywhere she goes, whether it's in music or at her workplace, uh, she's just a light for Christ in in a bold and refreshing way. So we really enjoy this conversation. You know, leadership is not always about a position that you're in. It's really about the influence you have. And uh, I think Pastor Justin says it well, that influence is the ability to affect, alter, and change the world around you. And Deborah is that exact case. It doesn't matter who you are. If the Lord gives her instructions to minister, she's going to reach out and do it without any hesitation or fear. And we love that about Deborah. So enjoy this conversation. We hope you get a lot out of it. And let's jump in. Well, welcome, Deborah. We're so glad you're here. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's going to be a fun conversation. We're really looking forward to it. But we did want to just start with hearing your stories, hearing where you're where you're from, um, what your life was like before Heritage, how you got to Texas. Can you just start there? Um, I've been here in Texas for 35 years. I moved from Illinois, like four hours south of Chicago, a little okay. town. Uh, it was a university there, so it wasn't a little town, but I... Um, moved there uh, at the age of 12, and I knew then I wasn't going to live in Illinois for the rest of my life. I kept telling my mom, this is not my home. I'm supposed to be somewhere else. So um, I moved here 35 years ago, and the way how it worked, I was really on my way to Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, That's what I prayed. That's what my plans was. So, but I met some people out of Texas and they was like, Hey, you need to come to Texas. I said, I just got laid off of my job and I need a job. I, you know, they was trying to hook me over the guy, but that wasn't the deal. I was like, I'm trying to find a job. I'm not coming to Texas for a guy. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyway, so he, uh, they said, well, come on out. Jobs are good. So I uh, moved to Texas and the way that happened was, uh, I prayed and asked God, if it's your will for me to be in Texas and of Georgia, um, you know, years ago, the in- income tax was coming through the mail, right? So my income tax was late. So I said to God, uh, if it's your will, let my income tax be in the mail Monday morning, then I'll know that Texas is where I'm supposed to be. Come Monday morning, my income tax you had a check. <laughs> so I packed up my stuff. My mother's like, you going by yourself? Yes, ma'am. I know a friend there, but I'm, and I've been here ever since. Every since, I, and I love it. To I Fort Worth? It. To Fort Worth. Yeah. Yes, Fort Worth. Love it. That's awesome. And so you weren't going to move for a guy. That was not going to happen. You no, weren't moving no, for a man. No, no, and, and And even though... I met the guy. Uh-huh. Uh, he wasn't about nothing. I mean, I mean, not that he was not a Christian, but mm-hmm. he wasn't for me. You know, um, just very controlling. Uh, I mean, I got a lot of stories to tell you, but I told him, I said, "I love your children, but I don't think I can marry you." You know, so because of his controlling ways, and he was like re- really controlling, and I and I was like, "What the?" You know, I was. I'm like, I can't handle this. Uh So, but I love these children. I'm like, I would take your children any day, you know? But you, (laughs) no. (laughs) That's good. That's good that you knew. (laughs) Yeah. So you didn't marry him? I didn't marry him. Have you been married? Uh, Never been married. Uh, Now, I was engaged, not to him, Mm -hmm. but I was engaged. (laughs) I was engaged to a guy that, uh, back home, that uh, we could we sung together we did choir together we traveled together with the choirs and all of that and I, at first I didn't like him like that but then um he pursued me so so I was like okay you know I, I'll give you a chance mm-hmm. but I fell in love with him and then he asked me to marry him well I mean I had got my got my wedding gown I made my girls' dresses, I did, because I sew, and I made all the dresses and everything, My, you know, and, but his pastor came to my house one day, and he said, you don't need that boy, and I said, what do you mean I don't need that boy, you know, I'm engaged, I have a gown, you know, we have already shopped for uh, uh, furniture right. and everything, mm-hmm. and he was like, you don't need him, I said, and he never explained to me why. To this day? To this day. Oh, he, you know, so finally when he left, I just fell on the bed crying like a, you know, I'm like, God, 
is this you talking to yeah, me? Yeah, right. You know, and so uh, I heard the Lord say, all things work together for the good to them that love me mm-hmm. and are called according to my purpose. Well, I did marry the guy. And so finally, after two or three years, you know, he was trying to get me back and all of that, but he had got out the church and I told him, I said, we will be unequally yoked. I love God and I'm not going to marry anybody out of the church right. and don't love mm-hmm. what I loved. So anyway, I, when I moved here, he wrote me the last time and then I got a call that he died of oh, AIDS. No. Oh, He died of no. AIDS. Wow. That's why the pastor said, you don't need that boy. And I tell young women all the time, you know, listen to your leader something, you know, listen and, and, and pray and ask God, is this the person for me? You right. know? Yeah. And so I was glad I could really shout it, you know, go and, and just hug God neck and say, thank you. You know, yeah. at first it was devastating, yeah. but you know, he died of AIDS. That's, that's, I mean, God protected you. He protected me. Yeah, he kept you. All the way he protected me. Even when the guy kept pursuing me, I was like, no, you're not even in church. You're not loving the Lord right now. Right. And I said, I don't want that for my life, you know. And even my mom was like, well, he's a great guy. I said, well, mom, you taught me Mm -hmm. not to marry unequally yoked. That's unequally yoked, you know. And, um, yeah, and he died of AIDS. He's been dead over mm, 15 years. 16 years. Wow. Yeah. So what protection? But you would like to have a husband someday. I would love to get married. Uh, <clears throat> now, my desire is I want a truck driver. And people <laughs> wonder, <laughs> and people yeah. wonder why. Yeah, well, you're going to have to explain that one. <laughs> yeah, <Okay. laughs> people wonder why. I tell them in my uh, uh, other class I have. Uh, uh, because I, I'm single. I've been single for 65 years. So my thinking is if I get a truck driver that love the Lord, he will be gone maybe 60 or 70 percent of the time and I will be able to handle it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But to live with someone in day in and day out, that's so huge adjust, adjustment yeah. for me for 65 years been on my own. Oh, right. You know? That is a, that is a huge adjustment. Yeah, it is. It I have is. friends that have gotten married late in life and they're like, wait, wait a second. This is two full <laughs> lives that we've put together yeah. as opposed to marrying young where it's yeah. like you're just you figuring out life. Right. You become adults Absolutely. together. Absolutely. It's totally different when you yes. get married at an older yes. age yes. and you're like, oh, you have a whole life right. that now we have to become one. How is that? How does that work? And I knew at that at in 20 or 30, I wasn't ready because it was my way or no way, mm-hmm. you know, and that's not how marriage work. You know, uh, so I was always a person that uh, did things on my own, accomplished things on my own work, got right. my own money and all of that. And so uh, who knows? And, uh, you know, everybody say you might be Sarah. Well, I don't want to be Sarah. <laughs> 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 but I know that that's my desire. And, and I, I know that God will, will work that out if it's his desire. He said he gives us the desires of, of our hearts, but our desires become his desires. Right. You know, I never stopped loving God. I never stopped. You know, for a while, I kind of got upset. God, why? You That's know, what I was going to ask. Know, yeah. My friends was getting married two or three times. And I'm like, oh, God, what's up? Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I'm faithful to you. You know, sometimes we think God owe, owe or something because we're faithful or we're living for him. He don't. I mean, it's like, you don't know. You don't see the whole picture, but I do, you know. And I told God, regardless of what, I love you. And I'm going to keep loving you, you know, and keep serving you, you know, so. I think it's a reoccurring, like, subject on this podcast is, like, trusting God's timing with things yes. and knowing that he has our best interest at heart. And right. He's he didn't forget. Right. He didn't forget those desires, you know. Like, he didn't forget that this is what you, you know, right. want. Right. It's just all in his timing and it's the it's perfect timing. Right. Now I don't desire having children, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've raised, <laughs> I've raised nieces and nephews mm. all of my life. Right. And children yeah. have been a part of your life because your life. job has been with CPS for right. how many years? 25, 20, 24 years. Uh, before then I, uh, worked at a daycare, um, then uh, the daycare closed. So I opened the daycare in my home for about a year or so. Okay. And I realized my business in my home, that was a whole lot, you know. So, and, and parents would come and pick their children up late, especially when they got paid, you know. <laughs> but right. um, my, um, I've, I've worked with children all of my life. Even in church, I work with children, 
you know, taught them, you know, songs and all of that. So that has been my life, and um, I, I've enjoyed it. I love to hear children sing and rejoice before the Lord, you know. That's awesome. What was your experience like with CPS? Cause it's quite a handful of a job. Yes. I work with uh, mothers, babies born on drugs. Oh, yeah. And um, my job was to take them back and forth to treatment centers, take them back and forth to the uh, doctor's appointments, um, <clears throat> uh, just everyday thing because it was an impact unit. So we only had a, a few cases, but we impacted that mom and that baby. Uh, everything they needed, we provided for them, you know. So we had a mother, I was telling um, that we had a mother um, that had eight children, and she was just strung out on drugs. And um, I would take her back and forth for treatment or whatever, and we had to remove the children. Mm -hmm. and, and she would get it together, and she would get clean, and we would place the children back. Then she would get off again. So one day she was riding in my car and I said, you know, what is what is the real deal? You know, what's what's going on? Why are you, you know? And so she broke down and began to tell me my mom and my dad treated me like this and they did this to me. They did that to me. And that's how I got on drugs. And so she began to cry and I told her, I said, listen. And I knew then that was a, a, a space for me to minister to her. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, I can take you to all of the treatment centers in this town, but you're going to have to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life because he can help you more than anybody else, you know. And so um, I said, and I, I'm going to just say this to you. I said, go out to the graveyard because they both was dead. Mm -hmm. Go out to the graveyard and just say whatever you want to say to them, you know, and leave it there, you know. I don't know if she did it or not, but I do know it wasn't long after she got into a treatment center. She got it together. She got her children back. And um, she uh, when 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 they when she was having a graduation, uh, she asked me to come. And she also became one of the supervisors of the drug center. Wow. That's what wow. amazing. Yeah. I mean, God can, you know, turn anything around. She got a home, her children that went to college. Just amazing. And when I first met her, I wouldn't have wouldn't have gave a dime for her. You know, because that's what I'm looking at. Right. But I was wondering, God, why do you have me in this um child protective services? Yeah. And God let me know this is ministry. Yeah. Ministry is just not behind the pulpit. Ministry is everywhere you go, even yeah. on your job. Because dealing with children and CPS, you have to have a heart of God. Um, I would pray for some workers to leave because they didn't have a heart for the yeah. children. You know, and I'm like, if you don't have a heart for children, then why are you here? Mm -hmm. Why are you here just to get a yeah. check? Are you serious? These babies need help. Even I stood, I would stand up even for the children that was in the foster homes, and I knew the foster homes was no good. Yeah, I would tell the workers, you need to go into that home and you need to check it out. There was three children I would drive every weekend to Corsicana. I would pick them up. They will be happy. They were happy with their mom. But the minute I turned that corner going to that foster home, they would start screaming and crying. And I said, what's wrong? You know, and so I had to go back to the foster because they did it twice. And I said, something is not. And they yeah. wouldn't. And the foster parent would never let me in the house. So I knew something was wrong. Right. And so I went back and told that worker, I said, you need to go in that house and you need to find out what is going on with those babies. Mm -hmm. You know, and she did. And she realized she had to remove, you know, so all foster parents are not the yeah. greatest. You know, what sure. So. It's a, that is it's such a broken system. It is such and a it's, broken system. Yeah. It's such a broken system and it's, it's hard to, like, you have to do something about it and you have to pray hard for those kids specifically right. because these, this is like the future, you know, this is the future generation mm -hmm. and there's so many kids out there that need your help and need your guidance and need your prayers. And right. when you're in that position to do something about it, you have to do it with you're all like you right. have to go in caring about every single kid. It's not just a case. It's not just another name on a sheet. You know what right. I mean? Like, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a child that needs some help. And, and a lot of time you would ask yourself, why is this child acting out like this? But 
until you know what that child been through, you know, mm-hmm. because you can just say, oh, well, stop acting like this. Stop doing this. There's but a we, reason. Re, there's a reason. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why. And when you read that case that that child been in 10, 11 foster homes, something Of course is they're wrong. acting out. That's right. what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. You know, there's no trust because the child don't know if they're going to be there today or tomorrow, whatever. Right. So um, I just, my heart was there and my heart is for the children, but they asked me, would you come back? And I said, I did 24 years. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. I've done it. I prayed. I've laid hands. Even when the kids didn't know I was laying hands on them. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, pray for uh, families, um, you know, to get it together. If not, then put the baby in a safe environment. You know, right. um, yeah. we don't, we didn't want to remove that's, that wasn't, now there was some workers. They love to do it, you know, <sighs> but I was like, why can we work this out? Right. Can we work this out with this family? Can we work this out? I, I remember one case that was a, a black baby. Uh, he had been with his grandmother for years. Well, the grandmother had a lot of stuff in her house. Well, if the child has been there over 10 years, he knows how to maneuver through the house. Mm-hmm. If you, if we had, and so the worker came, it was a white worker. Well, we need to remove. I said, how about we just help? Yeah. Right. How about we go in there and help clean up the house mm-hmm. or do something like that? You know, right. why remove the child has been there 10 years. Right. You know? And so she's looked at me and she's like, well, yeah, you're kind of right. Yeah. What do you right. mean? Right. Kind of yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that about kinda you. Right. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. I just, I mean, what the countless numbers of lives that you blessed and ministered to in that role is, I mean, it's like the, the apple seed thing, like one seed of an apple, you don't know how many apples actually come out of that. So every seed you planted in those kids and those families, even if you were like a small sliver of their story, you made an impact for the kingdom of God, which I think is so beautiful. Yeah. And so, am I, and also in that expect, uh, I would work with young ladies coming out of homes, $500,000 homes, and they thought that they were better than that one that came out of the ghetto. And I say, you have the same problem mm-hmm. that that woman has. Just and looks different. That's it, you know. Mm-hmm. And I say, and if you go in there with that attitude, they're going to eat you up alive. Because <laughs> they look at you, and you're on the same playing ground that they are on. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter how much money you make. You're an addict, mm-hmm. and they are going to allow, they're going to let you know who you are. Right. You know? And so she kind of like almost hated me. You know, I would have my music on, my gospel music. Turn it off. She would scream, I don't want to hear it. I said, this is my car, and I'm going to play what I want to play. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> and if you need a ride in my car, this is what I'm going to listen to. This is what's to, happening, you know? yeah. And finally, she came back and apologized. She said, you were absolutely right. They told me, and they did rip me up and down until I came to myself and realized I was an addict just like they were. Yeah. Wow. You know? I mean, that job is incredibly draining and Mm -hmm. it's a lot to handle because you're in these situations every day. Right. And, you know, dealing with children. I mean, it hurts your heart. Like it hurts to hear stories like that. Like it hurts your heart. But then taking that as an opportunity to minister to people and to help their situation, like no matter how draining it is on you, it's right. an opportunity to help somebody and change someone's life. Like that's a good, that's a better perspective to have than just, you know, feeling sorry or feeling, you know what I right, mean? Right, right, I, I know when I first started, I was like, why am I here? Cause yeah. I didn't want to be, but uh, I realized that, you know, God uses us in different situations and different. And I knew that um, Jesus is the only way uh, the only and I, I don't knock NA uh, AA, mm-hmm. not at all. But you need Jesus, you know. Right. And there was another young lady in 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 my car, and God told me to witness to her. I did not witness because I'm like I don't know this, you know. And I backed up, and the next day she died of an overdose. Do you know how I oh, felt? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I I asked God, Lord, if forgive me, I will never ever disobey you again. So he gave me another opportunity about a year later. This young lady was in my car. She had been shooting up. I said, baby, Jesus is the answer. Mm -hmm. 
you know? And she was like, I'm not. I said, are, are you ready to receive? No, I don't. That weekend, I came back that Monday, and one of the coworkers said, hey, you know the girl you sent, you took to NA or AA? I said, yes. She said, they found him, her dead, burned in the, up in the house because her, the guy killed her. But I was able to witness to her. Yeah. Right. And I felt, I said, God, thank you for another chance. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if she repented or not. You know, I know that God told me to say that to her. And yeah. I did, you know. And sometimes those those misses really inspire you to never miss it again. Yeah. I never, yeah. never. Yeah. I would never. And I don't. I, I, even if I'm walking in a, uh, a store and, and, and the Holy Spirit said, I was walking in the store one day, and this woman had uh, oxygen on, and God said, get out of your car and, and, and pray for her. And I was like, God, you know, <laughs> this woman don't know me. And he <laughs> said, but he, he didn't care. He knew yeah. the woman. So I jumped out, and I said, ma'am, you don't know me, but can I pray for you? She said, you certainly can. And I prayed for her. I don't know if God healed or not. I just know what God told me to do, you know. And I think that we have to be quick to obey God in any situation. Yeah. It sounds like your life is just a, like a lifestyle of, of outreach. Like it just yes. overflows out of your relationship with God. Is that something that's just developed over the years? Or do you feel like your relationship with God, it, that you're just walking out life mm -hmm. and it just overflows to other people? What is it? What is the dynamic like in, in you? Well, I, I, I knew years ago when God called me, he called me to basically evangelize. And everywhere I go, I offer Jesus. You know, um, I, um, for years, sung at a nursing home till COVID came, you know, and they wouldn't let you in after COVID. But um, I would go in and I would sing early morning, Sunday morning. I would sing hymns and uh, this elderly guy, because how I did that, how that happened was uh, that my dad was sick, uh, very sick. And um, I had been praying for my dad for 40 years to be saved. I said, God, if you have to save him on his deathbed, save him. I don't know if I should have prayed that prayer, but I did <laughs> pray that prayer, you know? And so anyway, uh, when he got really sick, I was here. He, he was in Illinois and I was, um, in the, my bedroom and I heard the Holy Spirit said, call your dad and ask him to receive me as Lord and savior of his life. So I called, he was in the hospital. They told me, um, well, Mr. Young, we're working on him right now. He can't talk. So I sit there and I stayed about 40 minutes, sit there in the bedroom, and God said, call your dad. So I called my dad, and they let me talk to him. I said, Dad, are you ready to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? He said, yes, I am. And he received the Lord. And I was on my way home the following day. I had stopped in Little Rock at the hotel that night. And I woke up at 5 that morning. And this is what I said to mine. And I knew the God told me this. I got up that morning, that five o'clock that morning, and I said, Good night, Dad. Not goodbye, but good night. And when I got on the road, my sister called and she said, You know, Dad is gone. I said, What time did he pass? She said, Five o'clock this morning. So I knew the Holy Spirit woke me oh. up to say good night to him. Mm -hmm. Because when you're saved, you don't say goodbye because I'm going to see him again. Yeah, right. You know? Oh, was it devastating? Yes. But I knew that God answered prayer. He saved my father. And so I said this, if, dad, if God, you did that for my dad, I will go in the nursing homes and sing praises till these people receive you. Because it's not over. I don't care how old you are. Mm -hmm. You can receive Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this elderly guy one day came to me. He said, I want you to sing at my funeral. You know? And I said, I sure will. And so Tanya asked me, well, did you? I said, well, they closed the doors. I couldn't get back in. So I don't know if he's living <laughs> or, you know, or gone. Oh, but no. he, his desire was he wanted me to sing at his funeral. So that just did me so much good to know that even at the last hour of your life, you can make it in. Yeah. Right. I want to know where like that boldness comes from to just get out of your car and pray for somebody that you don't know for somebody who like for a young believer, somebody who wants to like have that boldness, step out of their comfort zone and do that. Like, what would you tell them to do? Is it something you just have to like get over yourself and do? 
Well, yeah, it's something you have to get over yourself because you will wonder within yourself, oh, you know, this is my motto. I don't even want my enemy to go to hell. I don't want anybody to go to hell. So if God gives me an opportunity to witness to them, I'm bold enough to do that. Yeah. I, I'm bold enough to witness to the, the homeless on the street. Um, one of the reasons why my supervisor for 24 years that, wanted, that, that offered me the job at CPS, she said, I said, asked her, why did you hire me? Because I didn't do that good on the test. You know, she said, I looked at your resume and I knew you was not afraid to go into those homes or go into those situations where a lot of young people, young women don't want to go. Mm-hmm. She said, I knew by your resume what you did. Uh, you weren't afraid. And so God took that fear away from me because yeah. the fear that he took away from me because I was like, I don't want anybody to go to hell. Yeah. So I'm willing to to minister. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It sounds like music has been a big part of your ministry too. And it's how you use, God uses you to, to touch people's lives. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, I was 12 years old. I got saved when I was 12. I was at a church and the pastor got up and said, I need someone to sing a sermonic solo. Well, I didn't know I could sing. I really didn't. I really didn't. I mean, I didn't. But all of a sudden, my hand went up and I was like, I'll do it. So he said, well, come come on up and sing for me. And I got I might have just walked out. I might have just walked out. Like, (laughs) no, please, no, not me. No, he told me to come up and so I boldly went up. And I sung and it was like, people was like, what? You know, and it was like surprising to me. (laughs) But so I knew, (laughs) I knew it was a Holy Spirit. It wasn't just me singing. It was a Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. You know, and so from then on, he was like, Deborah, come up. We need you to sing a solo. Uh, Deborah, come up. We need you to lead this. So this voice is no training. No, like you just did. I have not ever had any training. Uh, my dad had a beautiful voice, mm-hmm. and I had a younger brother that just passed away. Uh, actually, he could sing better than me, you know. And I told him, I said, you have such a gift, you know. But um, I give all all the glory to God, all the glory to God, because not once. I went one time for a class because I had to sing at a wedding, and I had to sing the Lord's Prayer. And I, I needed to sing it right. And I was like, the guy was teaching me. And after he finished teaching me, I'm like, I paid you money for nothing. I could have done this, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but that's the only, only, only training I've ever had. Well, you're using your natural talent for, for good. You're using it to bring people to the Lord. Your voice is incredible. It really is. It's like, yeah, I, I wish I could sing like you. So yeah, sweet. it's incredible that at 12, you just had the boldness to be like, oh, that sounds like Yeah, a, I'm, I'm, I'm going to walk up right up there and just <laughs> sing. Yeah. yeah, never done it before, but I'm going to do it now. That's awesome. How have, you seen, how have you seen that ministry with music transform over the years? Um, I went 10 years ago, went into the studio. Uh, I wrote about five songs. My manager wrote five songs. Uh, so 10 songs was on the CD. Okay. And we... Um, we did that. Now I want to go back into the studio and do like three songs. And, um, the main song that I want, and I, I know God is pushing me to do that is good news. Jesus is coming. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm going to get back into the studio to get that song and two other songs on a CD. And, um, but the CD that I did 10 years ago, I would go to a lot of conferences. And so I sold them there, you know, um, and it was just people are asking, when are you going back into the studio? Um, I just have to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you and Danny on the worship team, y'all complement each other so well. Um, how long have you been on the worship team here at Heritage? Um, uh, when did I, about about four years. Um, I think about four years. I like when you get a little solo up there, you know. <laughs> Y'all bring the y'all, y'all bring it to to worship on a Sunday morning. How did you how did you get to Heritage? How did you find us? Okay, um, Vic Boone uh, had told me about Heritage of Faith, and uh, he said, "Oh, hey, you need to come over here. The pastor really preaches the word, you know." 
And um, I'm just going to be honest, right? And I told Tanya, I said, God, I've never been pastored by a white pastor before. <laughs> I've never been to like a white, you yeah. know. But I, but I came. Mm-hmm. And when I came, I came back again. Then I began to hear the word. And that was really just really impact me was the word of God that Pastor Justin was preaching. And um, I was like, wow, he has <laughs> a word in his mouth. <laughs> you know. And so I was looking around and I, one day, one Sunday, my sister was in town and she went up to the altar and I went up there with her. And I heard the Holy Spirit said, this is where I want you. And I said, God, at this church, you want me? You want me at a white church? (laughs) You want me at a white church, a white pastor? You know? And so anyway, um, when I stood there and I looked around, I saw every uh, creed nation. And I'm like, this is just not a white church. Yeah. It's 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 diverse. It is. You know? And I loved it because this is what heaven is going to look like, yeah. you know? And uh, if we can't get along here, how do we expect to get along in, hev- in heaven, you know? We have to learn how to love and get along with each other, you know? Uh, I love culture. I love other people's mm-hmm. culture. Right. I love to understand their culture and what they're, you know, their culture right. about. Yeah. Because I remember even at CPS, there was a... Um, they were teaching us and there was a baby that had all of these things on his back and we thought he was abused abused you know and they said no that's the indian culture where they take the dime and they just rub it over the child's back to get all of the ailments out of it i had no idea see most people don't know that and they would have been removing the child Mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying so i love the culture of knowing each other Knowing who you are, you know? Right. I want to, I look beyond what, you know, your color is. Yeah. You know, we have to know that we are sisters and brothers in Christ, you know? And it's so sad that we see that so crazy today that, you know. Right. And I tell people all the time, if you're a Christian, then you're my brother and you're my sister. Right. You know? Um, Yeah. So. That's one of the things I love about our church. I was There's just about to say that. Were yeah. you? The diversity is incredible and it right. culturally, color, whatever you want to call it, right. but even generationally. Oh, yeah. We have right. like every generation represented right. it. And that's one of my favorite, like my favorite things about our church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And everyone's stories too. That's like right. literally why we have this podcast. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, yeah, I love seeing how different everybody is, everyone, right? everyone's walks of life, everyone, everyone's culture. We all look different. We all act different. Yeah. It's the diversity of the gifts involved. I mean, I think, I think one thing that's brought about our church is the gifts that God's brought there through the people. Like we have people like you that obviously minister through music and evangelism, but we have other people have hot, I just, love to minister to the kids mm-hmm. or love to just be the servant's hands, you know, right. like the hands and feet behind the scenes right. that right. they're not necessarily looking for a platform, but God uses them in ministry mm-hmm. in the green room or yeah. in the kitchen or in facilities, whatever it is. And it I all can't plays do what you do, but I can do what I do. Right. right. You, you know? Yes. And we all work together. Yeah. You know, no one bigger than the other. You know, I need you. You need me. We need each other to survive. You know, we need each other. And when we look at it that way, we're able to handle it. Just because I disagree with you, I don't have to be... I don't have to become disagreeable. Right. You know what I'm saying? I don't have to come to the point that I don't want to talk to you anymore. We can disagree, Mm -hmm. but we don't have to be disagreeable. Right. You know what I'm saying? To the point that it causes strife and envy. Mm -hmm. That's not God. That's nothing God. You know, I I tell people all the time where I go around, I was like, if it's disorder, it's not of God. Mm -hmm. Right. God is all about order, you know, Mm -hmm. and he love it when he see his children worshiping together. You know, yeah. he loves to see that, you yeah. know, and, and John said, I saw a number that no, every creed, tongue, nation I saw, you know, and that's what heaven is going to look like. We all going to get a mansion. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you see, so, well, I feel like worship is a common ground between everybody anyways. So much. So true. So true. And that's why it's so important. It's yeah. because it is the common. We, like you said, we can disagree, but what are what all of our common ground is, is 
worship. Yes, yes. It's all about Jesus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's all about worshiping him, you know. Um, sometimes, you know, I, w- I, I went to a church. Actually, I went to a Baptist church, and they asked me to come and sing, right? So the guy got up, and he did the traditional Baptist can I sing a little bit of it? Because it was so. Yeah, I please. love the Lord. He heard my cry. I, well, that's what they did. And I was like, what are you? That's not singing. What are y'all doing? You know, this is what I'm thinking. Right. And I, the Holy Spirit took me. He said, if it's from his heart, I accept it. So wow. just because I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. Right. If it's from your heart, God loved it. Yeah, right. you know what I'm saying he loves it. He loves it. I love the diversity of music at our church. You know, I love even it. when Pastor Justin gets up there and tries to sing. Even right. when he <laughs> from sings, his heart. I told him, I said, hey. I you said, when you in the that. spirit, you on. T- <laughs> <laughs> when he get in the spirit, he gets on too. <laughs> right. Sure. When sure. he's in the spirit, he's on too. <laughs> no, it gives us hope. People who, who aren't necessarily gifted. Yeah. That we can yeah. make a joyful noise. Yes. And yes. If it's genuine, if it's coming from a place of worship, yes. then it's accepted yeah. and welcomed. And he loves it. It's he a beautiful loves incense it. in his yes. ear, his yes. nose, right? Yeah. I, love I, I think of like the tambourine players in the back of the churches and stuff like that. Uh, you know what I mean? Right. Like <laughs> might not be your cup of tea, but they're, they're, they're worshiping back right. there. They're doing their thing. They yeah, are. they are. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. That's so funny. Cause my sister just called me. Pastor Jerry was in Kentucky. So she went there to hear him. So she had a tambourine, right? Mm-hmm. And the lady came to her and told her, Oh, we don't do that at our church. No, I, I love it. I was like, she said that to you? She said, yes. I said, are you serious? You know? And I'm like, well, you know, what did you do? She said, I just put the tambourine down. I Uh play my tambourine, whatever. But I said, you should (laughs) (laughs) have. Yes. But anyway... Uh, people like different stuff, yeah, you know, right. I, I might not like your dress, but you like it. You bought it, you know? Right. Yeah. So who am I to, to judge? We That's can't with everything ju- too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, with, with everything. everything. Right. We cannot judge, yeah. you know? Uh, you know, I tell people all the time, people are like, well, he wasn't, you know, even with my brother's situation, uh, he waited till the, I asked him, I said, hey, are you saved? Are you, have you given your life to the Lord? He said, yes. So when he passed away, uh, at, uh, passed away and at the funeral I say he said he gave his life to the Lord and who am I to judge mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you can't judge either mm-hmm. right we can't judge each other mm-hmm. you know we have to love each other he told mm-hmm. us to love he said by this all men would know right. that you're my disciple is by your love right you know? And that kind of leads us into kind of the signature question of this podcast which is really examining what our our theme at Heritage is, which is making winners in life. Right. Um, we ask every guest and we want to really know your take. What does that mean to you? Making winners in life to me is um, ministering to the lost, um, bringing them, you know, they're coming into the kingdom of God. That's the greatest winner that you could ever, you know, that's the greatest thing you could ever accomplish in your life. Uh, you can have all the money, you can have all the houses or whatever, but if you don't have Christ, you have nothing. Mm-hmm. So the greatest thing in life is receiving Jesus Christ. You you are a winner. Mm-hmm. Winner, you know. Amen. I love that. That's a great answer. It's so it's so neat to hear everybody's uh, perspective on that. <laughs> I know, that like that one favorite. question we ask everybody, and everyone's answers are so different. It's really it's very interesting. Yeah. I love it. I think yeah. it, it just goes to speak to the the diversity of our body and yes. the perspective people have mm-hmm. and how we need to, as as brothers and sisters in Christ, really receive from each other yes. as it relates to how do you see the world? How do you see that? Yeah. Right. What does that mean to you? Absolutely. And it it, it it broadens our own horizons on, on really what is the heart of God? Cause yeah. his heart is expansive yes. and you have a side of it and Andy has a side of it and I have a side of it. And so it's really beautiful when it all comes Absolutely. together. So, well, thank you Deborah so much for coming in and having a conversation with us. It was, it was, it so, was amazing. so great. Yeah, it was great. And thank you audience and church family for listening. Just as a reminder, every Friday we drop a new episode. So be on the lookout for next week's.